Shabbat Shalom, everyone. I'm Monty Judah with Lion Lamb Ministries. Welcome to our teaching on this Shabbat morning, Messianic Teachings for Christians. This has been an ongoing program for some time. I hope it's a blessing to you. I hope that it's affirming your Messianic faith. And I hope if you're a Christian that's listening to this program, it's raising your interest level to understand really what the Scripture has to say and what it's all about for us. Um, in the previous program, I began to open up the topic of those that are not in favor of the different messianic teachings that I've been sharing with you, instead are trying to say that we're not supposed to be following the commandments and we're not supposed to be doing those Jewish things, as they like to say, but instead why well, we should be doing what the Apostle Paul said. And one of the big contentions that I'm making is, is that they're twisting what Paul said. Now, Paul did a lot of teaching. He was a Torah scholar, and he gave a lot of teachings, and a lot of people don't realize those are Torah concepts. That's actually what Moses taught and the, and the prophets taught. Moses, or, Paul was an expert in those things, and so he came in his letters teaching those things to be a part of understanding the work of the Messiah. The Messiah coming is not something different from the law and the prophets. The law and the prophets are the very foundation of how we substantiate who the Messiah is. And unless the Messiah does what Moses and the prophets said he would do, then he can't be a true Messiah of Israel. And But the Messiah did come. He did come fulfilling the prophecies that they had said. He came giving the same teaching that they gave. In fact, he argued that he gave an even greater teaching. He came to fulfill the law, and we've seen instances in the New Testament where he did exactly that. He's teaching commandments, but teaching them in a more full and understandable way. Now, Paul, being a Torah scholar and a believer of Yeshua, he is repeating a lot of that, and he's giving additional instruction in the form of his letters to various new Gentile believers coming in because he's trying to make up the fact that the Gentile believers don't have some of the base instruction to begin with, and but they've learned about the Messiah, and he's trying to give them a more full teaching. If you will, same thing I'm trying to do with you right now. I'm trying to share with you your faith in the Messiah is well-founded, and by the way, it's established and based on the law of Moses and on what the prophets said. And that when we get to the apostles, they're teaching those same things. Now, we've been reviewing an article written by a, um, a guy that is a, a church leader and a church teacher. He has a PhD, so he's an able speaker to the Christian faith, and he's taking issue with all of the teaching that I've been giving him. In fact, he's answering a question that came in, what about this Hebrew Roots movement? What about these Messianic believers? What, what, what about the, what, what are they doing? All that Messianic teaching that I've been sharing with you, he's being asked the question, what do you think of that? What, what is that? And so part of what he's done is I agree with him. He has represented to a very great extent the, the exact things that I've been sharing with you. And then he's trying to offer a counter argument going to quote some scriptures from Paul and try to say that Paul said something different than what I've been saying and what we've been teaching. And I will remind you again, as I have in the previous program, he makes the statement that the, what Paul has taught is perfectly clear in the New Testament. No, it's not. Even the New Testament makes comment through the Apostle Peter that there are some men unstable, untaught, that twist what Paul has said. Some of his teachings are hard to be understood. I can tell you why they are, because many of them are Torah concepts. They are deep Torah teachings. Now, if you're taught the Torah, you'll go, Paul, you're exactly right. You're, you're repeating exactly the base instruction. But if you don't have that original Torah teaching, and you don't know what Moses really said, that might lead you to think something else. And that is what has happened. 
Christian teachers have taken what the Apostle Paul, a Torah scholar, did, who's explaining Torah concepts to enhance your understanding of your faith in the Messiah, and twisted them to something else that makes the commandments go away, that we've got Paul teaching something different than what Moses said and something different than what Yeshua the Messiah said, do you realize that if they're right and that Paul taught against them, he's a false teacher and a false prophet. According to the law of Moses, you shouldn't be listening to a thing he says. And the Messiah said there would be false prophets that would come after him. Are you saying the Apostle Paul is a false prophet? Because you're claiming he's not teaching what they taught. You're claiming that they changed things. That can't be true. I believe the Apostle Paul is a true believer. I believe he believed in the Messiah. I believe he supported the law of Moses. I believe he came teaching those things. And when we read something that he has written in his various letters, and I hear some Christian take those words out of context, out of the meaning of what he said, twist them into something else that makes the law go away and tells you, you should not be obeying the commandments of the Lord, I submit to you that is evidence of a false teaching. I submit to you that a true teaching is one that enforces what the scripture has said, what Moses has said, what the Messiah said, what the prophets have said. And I don't see Paul doing what they claim he's doing. Part of the reason is because I kind of understand what Paul's saying because I kind of understand what Moses said to begin with, and I understand what Yeshua was talking about. But we have a lot of people who don't have that. Unstable, untaught, and as a result, they twist what Paul said. And we're in a review where we're looking at some of the verses that this fellow is offering that counters what I've been sharing with you about Messianic teaching. Last week, I took you to uh, where he talked about in Colossians chapter 2. I want to look at another scripture that he cites, uh, taking issue with, and it's, he decides to choose Romans 14, verse 5. And this is what he says in his article. Romans 14, verse 5 states, One person regards one day above another, another regards every day alike. Each person must be fully convinced in his own mind and Scripture clearly indicates that these issues are a matter of personal choice. These verses and many others give clear evidence that the Mosaic Covenant laws and ordinances have ended. What? He's talking about that, that a person would make some choices uh, involving some of their preferences about something and that as a result of us having the ability to make some choices about some stuff, that that made the, the entire Mosaic law go away? You've got to be kidding me. That's your argument? That is as foolish a statement as I've ever heard a Christian make. But let's go further with what he has to say. Continuing to teach that the Old Covenant is still in effect in spite of what the New Testament teachings or twisting New Testament to agree with the Hebrew roots belief is false teaching. <laughs> He's saying that I'm a false teacher. If I repeat what the Bible has said directly, and it clearly says that, he's saying I'm twisting the scriptures. However, it's he who's twisting the scriptures in the New Testament. So somebody is making a huge mistake. Either I'm twisting the scriptures and turning them around. I'm taking these scriptures in the New Testament. I'm twisting them to make them to say something they don't say. And, he, but, and he's correct that these scriptures he's citing made the entire Mosaic law go away, or it's the flip. He's twisting what the New Testament scriptures have said, specifically what Paul said, and making it say something it didn't say. Now, he just got through giving you Romans 14, verse 5, and he just said that verse alone just dismissed the entire Mosaic covenant laws and ordinances. Let me, let me examine that just for a moment. <clears throat> 
one person regards one day above another and another regards every day alike, each person must be fully convinced in his own mind. That's what the verse said. Are we talking about Sabbath? You know, I know Christians prefer Sunday, and we Messianics, we prefer Is Is that what that verse is about? Is it talking about um, you can do Sabbath whenever you want? Is that You know, I've heard some Christians going around saying, uh, well, you don't have to keep Sabbath even on Sunday. You can do it on Monday. You can do it on Wednesday. You can worship the Lord any day you want to do it, and so forth. Of course, the, the Scripture itself, the law of Moses says, he specifies it's going to be the last day of the week, and you will treat it as holy. And by the way, if you keep it, you're holy like the Lord, and if you don't keep it, you're unholy. And he commands us, I want you to be holy. I, the Lord, am holy. I want you to be holy. And he uses Sabbath as one of the definitions of how to be holy before the Lord. But this guy says, oh, you can make any day holy you want. Who determines what is holy, you and me or God? Holiness comes from God. It doesn't come from us. I, if I decide I'm going to make Sabbath on Wednesday, that did not make the Mosaic law go away. That did not make the commandment of Sabbath go away. That just means I've decided to do something goofy. It might be my preference, but it's goofy. I'm, I'm, and if I take issue with the Sabbath, now I'm really in error. Yet he just said that this statement is what makes the entire Mosaic covenant laws and ordinances go away. I don't understand his logic with regard to it. But let's talk about what verse 5 is really saying. Since he's twisted it to mean something it didn't say, Let's hear, Monty, what do you have to say that that verse is talking about? What do, you, what do you think it means? Well, if you're going to understand that verse, let's read the whole paragraph. Romans 14, verse 1 reads, Now accept the one who is weak in faith, but not for the purpose of passing judgment on his opinions. One person has faith that he may eat all things, but he who is weak eats vegetables only. The one who eats it is not to regard with contempt the one who does not eat, and the one who does not eat is not to judge the one who eats, for God has accepted him. Who are you to judge the servant of another? To his own master he stands or fails, and he will stand, for the Lord is able to make him stand. And then verse 5 says, one person regards one day above another, another regards every day alike. Each person must be fully convinced in his own mind. You know what the whole context of that is? Let's interpret it correctly. It's talking about that there are some brethren you're going to meet, they don't like to eat meat. Now, me, I, I do, and I think it's, it's just fine. A vegetarian does not get to come up to Monty and say, by the way, uh, Monty, you're really not living the faith correctly. You're not really holy unto the Lord correctly because you're eating meat. And, I, and by the way, in my mind, that's not proper to do. Well, that's fine. Uh, you may think that, but you, you're not my judge. And you don't have any authority over me with regard to that. You see, I'm the servant of Yeshua of Nazareth. I'm not your servant. Now, if I was your servant, I would be eating exactly what you specified for me to eat. If you come to my house and want to have dinner with me, you're going to eat what I put on the table. If you're going to be my guest, you'll eat that now. Okay? But since I'm not your master, I don't get to specify to you what you eat or don't eat. And by the way, if, if you want to do certain things on a certain day as opposed to when I do it, that's, uh, let's say... You decide you want to do laundry on Mondays. Well, I don't do laundry on Mondays. I like to do it on Thursdays. You can't come to me and judge me and hold me in contempt because I'm slightly different from you for reasons of foods or preferences of doing things. That is the interpretation of what Romans 14 is talking about. That Those verses are not explaining how the whole Mosaic covenant laws and ordinances have been done away with. That is ridiculous to make such a statement like that. 
Yet, guys, I'm here to tell you, that is the teaching of churchmen. That's what they're going to tell you. When I've shared with you the commandments and what the Lord has said about it, that's what they're going to try to offer to you. Um, let me read the verse right after verse 5. I think this will cinch it as to what is the proper interpretation. So I'm going to read Romans 14, 6. He who observes the day observes it for the Lord, and he who eats does so for the Lord, for he gives thanks to God, and he who eats not for the Lord, he does not eat and gives thanks to God. Does, does that sound like that we just made all the laws and commandments of the law go away? No. That says, whatever you sit down to eat before the Lord, why don't you thank him for it? Stop arguing over what it is that you're doing and start thinking it's God who provided that for you. Enjoy what the Lord's given. Is he given you a life so you could do this on that day or that day? Enjoy it and be thankful for it. That's what it's talking about. Now, that's a long ways away from what this guy is, is saying here in this article against us. Let me continue on with what else he has to say. There are aspects of the Hebrew roots teaching that certainly can be beneficial. Wow, that is tremendously magnanimous of him to acknowledge there might be something that we've said that might be encouraging and correct. Seeking to explore the Jewish culture and perspective within which most of the Bible was written, Wow, he's actually admitting something here. Opens and enriches our understanding of the scriptures, adding insight and depth to many of the passages, parables, and idioms. And there's nothing wrong with Gentiles and Jews joining together in celebrating the feast and enjoying a messianic style of worship. Taking part in these events and learning in which ways the Jews understood the teachings of the Lord can be a tool giving us greater effectiveness in reaching the unbelieving Jew with the gospel. It is good for the Gentiles in the body of Messiah to identify in our fellowship with Israel. However, to identify with Israel is different from identifying as Israel. Now, he just made an excellent argument for why you should be listening to this messianic teaching. Because that's what I'm doing. I'm mean, enriching your faith. I'm explaining the context of what Yeshua was talking about, what the, what the apostles were talking about, the basis of which they come for it. That's enriching and fulfilling and helping you to understand even better the words of the Messiah and his teachings. He agrees that's what it is. But then the issue he takes with is the last sentence. However, to identify with Israel is different from identifying as Israel. I absolutely agree with this assessment. See, if you believe that Yeshua is the Messiah, but you don't want to have anything to do with Israel and what that means in the Bible, you're not part of the Messiah. The Messiah is the King of Israel. That is the name of his kingdom. And by the way, when we get to the kingdom, you know, the ultimately, for example, that have you heard about that prophecy, New Jerusalem? I love this one. It's there in the book of Revelation toward the end. It talks about the New Jerusalem coming down, and it's talking about the 12 gates, pearly gates that are named after each of the 10 or 12 tribes of Israel, and the foundation stones are named after the 12 apostles, and the height of the wall is 144 cubits, and it's precious stones. And he gives this beautiful description of this place that's ultimately going to be our, our, our future home with the Lord. Well, one of the questions I like to pose is the following. Which gate were you planning on going through to get in there? Because they're only named after the 12 tribes of Israel. Which tribe of Israel do you relate to so that you can be a part of that? By the way, way back when the children of Israel came out of Egypt, there was a bunch of aliens and sojourners. They didn't number them separately from the tribes of Israel. They were numbered with the tribes of Israel. 
and there were lots of aliens and sojourners who were part of the different tribes of Israel. Are you aware of the fact that Caleb, the, um, the, the guy that led the tribe of Judah when they went into the uh, Promised Land, wasn't even from that tribe? He was a Gentile, but he was numbered with the tribe of Judah, and he was in charge of the tribe of Judah. How about that? Huh? Isn't that interesting? How about Elijah, the Tishbite? What tribe? Say, what tribe is Elijah, the Tishbite? He's not part of the tribes of Israel. He's a Gentile. He's a Tishbite. Okay. Yet we regard him as a prophet belonging to Israel. It turns out that all of the previous characters that we learn about patriarchs of the faith, they're all part of the definition of Israel. And you and I today, as we come to faith, we are counted as part of Israel. Paul says we're grafted into the tree called Israel. Now, some of us are natural branches and some of us are wild branches, but we're all part of the same root and same tree. We're all part of Israel. And Paul says in Romans 11, when he's talking about the whole grand scheme of everybody come together and we're all, we're all going to be in the kingdom, he says, thus all Israel shall be saved. He doesn't say Israel, the Jews will be saved along with a bunch of Gentiles called the church. He says, thus all Israel shall be saved. He, he encompasses, in fact, he says, all of us are the commonwealth of Israel. You better be part of Israel if you're planning on being in the kingdom. This guy is saying, no, you can't be as Israel. My friends, if you don't figure out how to become a citizen of Israel, a spiritual citizen under the king of Israel, the Messiah, you will not be in the kingdom. God has not set up two kingdoms. One is called the church and the other one's called Israel. There's one kingdom. It's called Israel. What about this church thing? Well, that's a it's, a, it's a fabrication. It's an imitation. It's a substitute that's been set up to take odds with Israel. And this guy is espousing he's not part of Israel, and he doesn't want you to be part of it. Oh, it's okay for the Hebrew roots teachers and Messianic teachers to enrich your faith and teach you about all these things, but don't become part of them. Don't make this real in your life. Just play with the stuff. I'm not here to advocate that you play with anything. I'm here to advocate that you need to learn these things because it is part of your faith. He goes on to uh, say this. You're going to love this one. Gentile believers are not grafted into the Judaism of the Mosaic Covenant. They are grafted into the seed and faith of Abraham, which preceded the law and the Jewish customs. Okay, now he's taken the teaching of the Torah, and here's what he has said. Actually, there's two things taught by Moses. There is this seed of Abraham, there'll be descendants of them, but the Israel thing, that's another thing. You really want to advocate that's what he taught? You really want to say that God set up with Abraham to do one thing this way, but Isaac and Jacob to set up Israel was that thing. And down in the history, you can be part of this, but not part of that. My Bible is very clear that the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, that's the one that built the kingdom. It's called Israel. There's not an alternative set up for the Gentiles prior to the law, prior to Israel. This is the plan of God. Build the nation of Israel to be a light to the nations. This would be the name of the king. This would be the element that would bring forth the Messiah, the Savior for the world. The Savior of the world is the seed of Abraham. The promise was given to Abraham that in his seed all the families of the earth would be blessed. Absolutely. That is the promise of the Messiah. That promise of the Messiah came through Israel. It wasn't separate from Israel. And he's claiming because what Abraham did was prior to the law, that somehow that justifies that you are not to be part of the commandments and where the Messiah came from, that the Messiah came through something else. This is fundamental. 
These are fundamental truths in the scriptures, and he has absolutely distorted them. Yet this is the guy telling you, don't obey the commandments of the Lord. Don't do it. Let me go ahead and give you some of the other argument he gives. They are fellow citizens with the saints, Ephesians 2, 19, but they are not Jews. I never did advocate to make you Jews. You see, he's got that stereotype in his head. He thinks everything that has to do prior to Matthew is Jews. He doesn't understand it's a book full of Hebrews. Jews is a subset. It's one of the tribes. In fact, the term Jew really has to do with the people that live in Jerusalem in the land of Judea. And that's how it's possible you could have people from the tribe of Judah, possibly the tribe of Benjamin, possibly from the Levites, who are not called Jews. They'll all be called Jews because they're from the land of Judea. And that term, Jews, didn't show up until in the days of the prophet Jeremiah when Babylon was coming to defeat Jerusalem. And the people that lived near Jerusalem were called the Jews because they were in that land. Um, but yet that whole terminology and stereotype has carried over into the New Testament and into the church. And they think the world is divided into Jews and Gentiles instead of historically what it really is and what the Bible talks about. Um, again, again, let me, let me emphasize this. As I come to you and share this to you, I'm, I'm not trying to make you into a Jew. You're not Jews. You're from the nations. But God wants all the peoples of the world to be part of his kingdom. He wants all people saved, not just the Jews. And Israel, he's made the nation big enough, and he's made it in such a way that no matter where you come from, you get to be part of Israel. You get to be part of the citizenry of the kingdom. And you got to have a nation if you're going to have a citizenry. He built all these things for the benefit of all people in the world. He goes on further. Of course, he brings up the 1 Corinthians 7, 18 thing about the circumcised and the uncircumcised and twists that whole thing around. That, let me just give you a quick one on that one. Circumcision primarily has to do with the sign of the covenant with Abraham, with the land of Israel. If you're going to be in the land of Israel, the requirement is you're going to be circumcised. If you're not in the land of Israel, there is not a physical requirement for circumcision. But Paul goes on to say, you know, that whole lesson about circumcision, it's really about you being separated unto the Lord and holding to his covenants. And by the way, as we mentioned before in Colossians 2, it talks about well, you and I, Gentiles, everybody, has received the circumcision without hands by the regeneration of the Holy Spirit when we got saved. That we've been cut off from the world. We're now separated unto the Lord, which is what the rite of circumcision is all about. Yet he's twisted that again. Let me go to another one. He talks about the one new man. I love this one in Ephesians 2.15. That he's made Jews and Gentiles into one new man. You're absolutely right. Every person, I don't care where you come from in this world, when you come into the Messiah, you become one new man. You are a new creation. You're a citizen of Israel. You're one of the servants of the Most High, and he is your king. And you get to go into the kingdom just like me. And when you want to go worship the Lord in the temple and offer sacrifice, you get to do it exactly the same way I do it. You get to worship the Lord exactly the same way. You are not excluded. There's no separation anymore whatsoever. By the way, are you aware of what the Pharisees did and the Sadducees did in the temple in the days of Yeshua? See, they came up with the idea that we Jews are different from the Gentiles. And those men, back in those days, they built a wall that went around the temple complex in the court of the Gentiles, and they built a wall that said, no Gentile can go past this wall. It's called the middle wall of partition. It was never called for by Moses. It was never called for by King David or Solomon when they built the temple. It was created by the Pharisees and the Sadducees after they came back from Babylonian captivity. They wanted to exclude the Gentiles. And they did. 
In fact, they used to have a thing that said, any Gentile going past this point will suffer death. You know what they arrested the Apostle Paul for? You remember when Paul uh, came back to Jerusalem, there was a rumor about he wasn't keeping the law. He was teaching other people other things than that. And to prove to all the brethren that he walked orderly keeping the law, he took four men into the temple to cover their Nazarite vows. When he went in, other people in the temple saw Paul, and they had a riot, and he got arrested. You know what they charged him with? They charged him that the four men that he had brought in had gone past the middle wall of partition, and he had brought Gentiles into the temple. That's what they charged him. They claimed that middle wall of partition, that he was guilty of violating that. Now, the men that he brought in, they were all Israelites. Now, other men were claiming they were Gentiles. They were Hebrews. They were keeping the commandments according to Moses. But you see, the Pharisees got this idea, well, you Gentiles, you can't keep the law. You know, we, we shouldn't be teaching you those commandments. Well, that's what he did. He took, he took four men that were obeying the commandments of the Lord, going before the altar, just like Moses had said, and they arrested him for bringing Gentiles into the temple. That's what they charged him with. The today... We have that same nonsense still going on. Judaism, when they try to explain how Gentile comes and how how Gentiles, what commandments are Gentiles supposed to keep? I'm, I'm a Jew now. I'm, 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 I'm a rabbi, a Jewish rabbi. And Ed, Ed, you Gentiles, what, what should you You only should keep seven commandments. The commandments that Noah kept. You keep the Noahide laws they teach. Not the Ten Commandments, the Noahide laws. Those are the only ones you have to keep. And by the way, don't, don't be keeping the Ten Commandments. Don't be keeping the Torah. That's what Judaism says. That's what Christianity, they don't necessarily tell you to keep the Noahide laws, but they definitely tell you don't keep the Mosaic laws. That's what this guy is saying. Don't keep those commandments. I can show you the example of the Apostle Paul taking men in who were keeping the laws of Moses, the Nazarite vow laws. And they were supposed to be there. They were keeping the commandments correctly. This is the New Testament. This is the Apostle Paul trying to prove that he walks orderly keeping the law also. They don't even understand the charges that came against Paul. They don't even understand what he was doing. That's in the book of Acts. Let me go ahead and add this. You know, when Stephen, the first martyr of the new covenant faith, was that when they took him out and stoned him, um, in his defense, he recounted the whole story of what God had been doing with Israel. <clears throat> Led right up to the Messiah becoming the Messiah. It, 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 he didn't talk about the Messiah as something separate. He talked about the Messiah that has come forth is that which was told to us before by Moses and the prophets. He was talking to an audience, showing the Messiah is the fulfillment of those things. He, he's what we were always going for. Of course, they rejected that. You know why? It turns out there was a false, a set of false witnesses saying false things about Stephen. Acts chapter 6. What were the false statements? This man has come teaching that this Jesus came to do away with the temple, the commandments of the Lord, and the customs of Moses. Now, the New Testament says those are the words of false witnesses. They stoned Stephen on the basis of that they heard that he was teaching that Jesus came to do away with the temple, the law, and the customs of Moses. You know who was standing there that gives testimony to that trial, who was holding the coats and cloaks of the men who stoned Stephen? It was the Apostle Paul before he was a believer. The Apostle Paul knew very good and well, making a statement that Jesus came to do away with the temple service the commandments of the Lord and the customs of Moses. He knew those were the words of false witnesses. 
In fact, he's the one that gives the testimony in Acts chapter 6 to tell us that history. Yet we go around saying the Apostle Paul taught exactly that. Exactly what the New Testament says is false testimony. And we have other gentlemen here, believers, still advocating exactly that same thing that was being done. Um, then, of course, we always jump into the book of Galatians. I love this. The, um, a lot of Christians think the whole book of Galatians, Galatians is the one that really makes the law go away. So let's put the book of Galatians, before we even get into this, let's put it in context. So what is the book of Galatians about? Well, it turns out there was a bunch of Gentiles who had come to faith through the teaching of Paul. And they believed in the Messiah. They had received the gifts of the Holy Spirit. They, had, they were excited about discovering the law. And they, 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 they wanted to keep the commandments of the law. And along came a bunch of Pharisees. They didn't. They didn't necessarily believe in the Messiah, but they were keeping the law. And they decided to further instruct the Galatians. Said, oh, no, 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 you're not keeping the commandments right. If you you got to keep them this way. you got to keep them the way we do them. And completely misdirected them away from the Holy Spirit and completely misdirected them away from the Messiah. God forbid that such a thing could happen in this world. But, hey, it happens. And Paul finds out what's going on, and he writes this impassioned letter to the Galatians, begging them to get back on track. And one of the things he does, and that's the reason why they like to cite this book, is he will be very pointed and take issue with the Pharisaic teaching. He will point out where the Pharisees are in error. Just like I'm sitting pointing out the error of this fellow, he was taking issue with the error of the Pharisees. And so he said some very strong things against the Pharisees and what they were saying. And of course, the average Christian, not knowing the context of this, would say, oh, he speak, Paul's speaking against the law. No, he's, te he's speaking against the Pharisaic teaching of the law, not what Moses said, not what Yeshua taught, not what th they were teaching. He's trying to point out there's a big difference between what a Pharisee says and what Moses has said. By the way, let me repeat it for you today. There's a huge difference between what a Judaism rabbi teaches and what Moses says. Huge. And when I get an opportunity to sit down with a rabbi or my other Jewish brethren, guess what we talk? We don't have to talk about Yeshua. We talk about what Moses said. And it's under the auspices of exactly what Yeshua said. He said, had you listened to Moses, you would have known that he was speaking of me. But because you don't believe the words of Moses, how will you believe or understand my words? That's John chapter 5. Let me see if I can turn that around a little bit and make application for us. Yeshua said, that Moses was talking about the Messiah. We all want to learn about the Messiah. We want to follow the Messiah. He's the pinnacle of our faith. Then why shouldn't we be using Moses as part of our teaching to tell us about the Messiah? That would make sense because Yeshua said, had you, uh, you know, Moses wrote about me. But then he goes another step and he said, but if you don't believe the words of Moses, how will you believe or understand my words? This gentleman is saying, don't believe in the words of Moses. Don't believe what Moses has written. Okay, if I understand what Yeshua said, it says, if you take that posture, you will not understand his words and what he was talking about. Hey, brethren, that's exactly what we're facing here. We have men who advocate that they believe in the Messiah, and yet they don't believe in Moses. As a result, they don't understand what Yeshua was talking about. They don't get it. They kind of give lip service to it. They kind of speak to some of the same stuff. But the understanding of it and the application into their walk and their life, it works out this simple. You know, they say they believe that Yeshua is the Messiah, 
He's Savior. He's the one that's forgiven them the sins. But don't follow his commandments. How is that believing in him? Wouldn't believing in him mean you trust him as your Savior? You wholeheartedly love him with your heart, soul, and your might, and you obey his commandments. And oh, by the way, you finally get the vision and figure, oh, that's right, God is one. That means that Yeshua was up on Mount Sinai and he was speaking those commandments. He's the one that gave the Torah to Moses. If you All of a sudden you get the perspective of who God really is. You go, well, wait a minute, if he gave it to him, and that, that we're supposed to keep that. I guess that's what Yeshua was talking about when he said, if you love me, keep my commandments. We're not talking about a made-up set of commandments that churchmen get to figure out and pick and choose. We're talking about the ones that Yeshua gave. And when he said that, brethren, there was no New Testament. There was only Moses and the Torah. So what do you think Yeshua was referring to? I think he was referring to what he did at Mount Sinai. So why in the world are we having the discussion to say that we believe in the Messiah and yet we don't do what he says? How did we get to that point? Well, it's a long story. It's been going on for hundreds of years. And it's the reason why we have Judaism and Christianity. And then we have Moses and the prophets and here we are at the end of the ages trying to figure out which end is up. Having to step away from Judaism, having to step away from Christian teachers like this and sort out what is the truth. I, I must tell you that uh, um, for me personally, I, I have a heart for you guys. This is a struggle. This is difficult. I, I will tell you from my own personal testimony, I've been walking the Messianic movement for more than 35 years. There are certain concepts that I now understand and believe. It took me 10 years to sort them out. See, back when I got involved, there weren't, even, there weren't that many teachers. And as a result of my own experience of having to, quote, relearn the Bible from the basics, um... I've committed my life to, I'd like to help other brethren that are going through the same transition. I would like to see my brethren who believe in the Lord, trust the Messiah, learn about the Messiah, and then not perpetuate this myth and this false teaching that you get to believe in the Messiah, but you get to turn around and disobey the Lord. That is not the truth. Let me go on, uh, let me conclude here what he has to say in his article, and it kind of brings it in full perspective for us. It's important for Jews and Gentiles to remain authentic in their own identity. In this way, a clear picture of the unity of the body of the Messiah can be seen as Jews and Gentiles are united by one Lord, one faith, one baptism. May I also conclude that for just a moment. He's absolutely right about one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one law, too. All of us. Not separate. Not not one's an upper-class citizen of heaven, one's a second-class citizen of heaven. Um, I am not advocating that you Gentiles are second-class citizens to the, to the kingdom and me. That's nonsense. By the way, I know some brethren that do that. But the scripture clearly teaches we're not supposed to do that. Have you ever heard anybody say the great and glorious church that will be above Israel? You know, we get raptured out. We get to go to heaven. And then poor Jews, holy mackerel, they have to sit down there, go through the great tribulation and so forth. Does that sound like one Lord, one baptism, one faith, one law to you? I don't think it does. I think they're setting up divisions based on false things. So he goes on to say, if Gentiles are grafted into Israel, quote, becoming Jews, by the way, being grafted in Israel doesn't make you a Jew, although he's claiming it does. 
The purpose and picture of both Jew and Gentile coming together as one new man is lost. I would agree with that. The one new man is a new creature in the Messiah. We drop the Jew-Gentile titles. We just become sons and daughters of Abraham. And the kingdom, the bosom of paradise, is called the bosom of Abraham. When I get to the kingdom, I'm not going to be going around asserting, oh, I'm a Jewish believer. I'll be saying I'm one of the sons of Abraham, just like everybody else there. That's the kingdom. So his whole contention that that's what we're trying to advocate is false. We do not advocate that. Um, he says here, God never intended Gentiles to become one in Israel. You've got to be kidding me on that one. Oh my gosh, I guess all those scriptures that Moses gave to us, I guess Moses was a false teacher. He said, these commandments are perpetual. They are forever. And it is to include the native born, the alien, and the sojourner. There shall be one law, one commandment for everybody. Forever, he said. Well, according to this guy, Moses was wrong. Wow. Man, I guess his credentials are far more impressive than what Moses had to say. I guess, let's make a choice. Should we listen to this guy or should we listen to Moses on this point? I've, I've, I've already made my decision. I'm going to listen to what Moses had to say on that. See, I believe... <clears throat> The God, Moses came speaking to us what the Lord told him to speak to us. I don't hear the evidence that God told him to say this to us. I don't see the evidence here that God has commissioned him to come and give this teaching. I see a man who's perpetuating the teaching he got from other men, and I see him coming and specifically saying to us things contrary to what the Lord has said through Moses and the prophets. Let me give you the um, last thing that he had to uh, say here. The influence of this movement, referring to Hebrew roots and Messianic teaching, is working its way into our churches and seminaries. That is absolutely correct. It's dangerous in its implication that keeping the old covenant law is walking a higher path and is the only way to please God and receive his blessings. Well, let me go ahead and repeat it for you. It's emphatic in the Bible that if you obey the Lord, you receive blessings. If you disobey the Lord, you get curses. It's emphatic that it says that. So yes, we advocate that if you obey the Lord, look for the blessings. If you disobey the Lord, get ready for the curses. Nowhere in the Bible do we find Gentile believers being instructed to follow Levitical laws or Jewish customs. In fact, the opposite is taught. Well, we have to dismiss, you know, the entire law of Moses because that's all it teaches. That's all it teaches. Now, Judaism teaches something different, and Christians obviously teach something different, but I can show you in the Scripture emphatically it teaches all people to love the Lord their God with the heart, soul, and might, and love their neighbors themselves. You know what? It, it Actually, one of the core teachings of the Torah is you know that verse about love your neighbor as yourself? We actually teach um, in the Torah. It's not talking about a fellow Israelite. When it says love your neighbor as yourself, it includes that that commandment is to include your fellow man who isn't necessarily a believer in the God of Israel with you yet. He just happens to be your human being neighbor that you're to love him as yourself. You're to care for other human beings, even beyond those of your shared faith. That's a pretty emphatic commandment about dealing with the Gentiles and about how to treat Gentiles. That's the second greatest commandment of the law. He goes on to say this, Romans 7 uh, six says, but now by dying to what once bound us, we have been released from the, from the law 
so that we may serve in the new way of the Spirit and not in the old way of the written code. Um, again, I'm going to just remind you, and he Paul does the same thing in the same book of Romans. If you read chapter 6 first, you'll find out what he's talking about. In chapter 6, he's emphasizing how great grace is. Grace is absolutely wonder. It's this favor we get from God that's just, we don't deserve it, we get it. And he explains that even though we've been sinners, that God has still loved us and saved us and, and extended grace to us. But he deals with the following subject. If grace is so wonderful and we've got it, does that mean that we're permitted to go ahead and just voluntarily violate the commandments of God? You know what Paul says? God forbid. Grace is not for that purpose. Grace is not for the purpose to walk away from the commandments or not learn the things of God. Grace is just this wonderful benefit we get from having a relationship with God. That's the chapter before the, we're going to read chapter 7, and here's what he says in chapter 7, verse 6. But now by dying to what was bound us, we have released, the, released from the law so that we may serve in the new way of the Spirit and not in the old way of the written code. You know, he's, he's given the conclusion, well, how do you keep the commandments and still yet have grace? Well, it's easy. You obey, and God still is gracious to you. And by the way, the grace of God isn't necessarily, you don't get the grace of God because you keep the commandments of God. Grace is unmerited favor. You didn't do anything to get it. Therefore, it's not connected to the law. A law is obedience, which produces blessings. But I can assure you that grace goes beyond just simple blessings. Grace all goes all the way to salvation. For by grace are you saved through faith. Having blessings alone doesn't get you saved, but grace will get you there. And Paul's trying to teach the difference here. It's not that complicated. So let me go ahead and give you his final statement. He quotes from Romans 7, 7. He says, what shall we say then? Is the law sin? May it never be. On the contrary, I would not have you come to know sin through the law, for I would not have known about coveting if the law had not said you shall not covet. You're absolutely correct. The law reveals transgression. For example, if the law says do not covenant, well, I didn't realize that wanting something beyond what I have is a sin. Well, the law told me that, so therefore, I, if I do that, I transgress. I, I didn't know that that was a sin until the law told me it was. What is wrong with that? I, I, I believe that's just the basic instruction. Okay, here's the final. The Messiah, in keeping perfectly every ordinance of the Mosaic law, completely fulfilled it. All right, okay. We're back to the famous fulfill word. Remember me telling at the very start of this, I did not come to abolish, but to fulfill. And they're going to tell you the word fulfill means get rid of it. Let me keep reading. Just as making the final payment on a home fulfills that contract and ends one ob obligation to it, so also Christ has made the final payment and has fulfilled the law, bringing it to an end for us all. Let me go ahead and restate it for him essentially abolishing the law. It is God himself who has created a world of people with different cultures, languages, and traditions. God is glorified when we accept one another in love, come together in unity as one in the Messiah, Yeshua. It's important to understand that there's no superiority of being born Jewish or Gentile. We're all followers of Christ, comprised of many different cultures, lifestyles, all of value, greatly loved because we have entered into the family of God. Um, well, that's nice that you said that. I, that's what I've been saying and so forth. But that statement about that the Messiah fulfilled the law and it's no longer applicable, that's what I shared with you from the very beginning. Don't even think that I came to abolish the law and the prophets. That's what the Messiah said. This guy not only thinks it, he teaches it. I'll remind you of something else that Yeshua had said right after that. 
He said, if anybody comes to you and teaches you and attempts to annul the least of these commandments, he shall be least in the kingdom of heaven. Wow. This guy's taken on some pretty heavy commandments, not least commandments. He's taken on some big commandments and said, they're annulled. Don't teach those. Certainly don't do them. Don't identify as being the people of God. You be something separate. Uh, as far as those Jews and Israel, they're, they're off on the side. We, this is where we need it. We need to be with the church. And we're the good guys. They're the bad guys. Stick with us. That's his teaching. This is going to conclude this particular thing that we have done on this. I have one more um, um, book that I want to review with you, which is a counter argument. I want to show you a couple of things in it. But let's uh, conclude this particular session by saying this, and this is what I've been saying to you all along. You need to make a decision about your faith. Let's agree that we all believe in the Messiah. Now, are you going to listen to the Messiah and the prophets and Moses who advocates for the Messiah and Yeshua advocates for him are you going to listen to the apostles who are teaching what Moses said? Are you going to do that? Or are you going to listen to some churchmen tell you what not to do? Uh, that's the question you have to answer. Shabbat Shalom to all of you. Thank you folks for viewing our broadcast here on the YouTube channel. I'd like to remind you if you could hit that like or subscribe button for it, it's very helpful to our organization.